Hey guys, it's Jason Snavely, certified wildlife biologist and founder and president of Drop Time Wildlife Consulting, the Drop Time Seed Company, and of course, Drop Time Podcast. Guys, I've uh, 17 years private wildlife consultant, uh, graduated from Mississippi State University, and uh, you know one of the things I really enjoy doing is traveling the country and watching clients realize their dreams of taking a small piece of property and turning it into something really really special. All right, welcome back. There you go. I had some clients in the last one and some listeners email me, text me and say, hey, where's the intro? They were upset that I didn't didn't do the intro. I just wanted to mix it up a little bit. And I I literally jumped into the middle of a conversation that Adam Doherty and I had or were having at the time. So uh, it, it started off a little bit differently, and I guess some of you were uncomfortable with that. So there you go. There's the intro. Um, first of all, holy cow, I want to say thank you to everybody who sent a massive amount of um, emails, texts, and phone calls. Apparently, everybody enjoyed Adam, and I know Adam has spoken at places you know, like No Till on the Plains and other conferences, and people love him. He's almost the funniest guy in soul health. Um, I've got him on today actually with us. He's, he's sitting here quietly. Uh, You'll hear his guineas in the background, too. But uh, we've been having a little bit of an issue with connection uh, because of where he's at. But I think we found the spot. He's sitting in a chair in the middle of the yard. And uh, hopefully we can get this done today. But uh, so before I get started, um, I want to cover some of the some of the questions about reload today. Um, I get a massive amount of emails on, you know, on reload. And I, I completely understand why, because it's a new idea. Um, I keep saying I wish more people would follow. Well, it sounds like they are. I'm sure you'll find out here in the next couple of months who has decided to follow along and uh, blend seeds with the same company that uh, that I felt was important to go to two or three years ago. Um, and I also want to, you uh, know, we're going to talk a little bit about what, you know, the, the number one question is, what. so what is in this reload? What's in spring reload? What's in summer reload? Um, I'll get into some of that here on the podcast. Um, but more importantly, the why behind, uh, the the development and the blending of it. And, um, you know, again, I just want to throw out there, obviously I do not accept any advertisers. This is fully funded by drop time, um, which is obviously owned by me. So if you could do me a huge favor and go on there and enter a review, Um, obviously rate it. If you can do a five star, we would appreciate that. I love reading the reviews and that's quite frankly, what drives us to keep going, uh, since we do not monetize, uh, from the podcast. So I want to get my, my guest on today where, um, (laughs) yeah, I wanted to have him on last year at the end of the year. Uh, but unfortunately we, we just couldn't pull it off. I don't like to have guests on too many times or multiple times because I like to find new ideas and new information. But in my opinion, uh, which is fact today, this guy is, well, he loves guineas. I mean, you can hear the guineas in the background, but I've had him on the podcast more than anybody. In fact, episodes 11, 14, and 16, I think, um, if you like what you're hearing today, there's some really good groundwork in those three podcasts. Uh, so go back to 11, 14, and 16. But uh, this guy was was recently at his class reunion. I, I, I'm going off of memory, so I, I hope I say this right. But he was voted as most likely to be dead or in a rock and roll band. And uh, ironically, in my opinion, without him, this whole soil health movement and regenerative agriculture or whatever terminology you want to use it just wouldn't be wouldn't be possible wouldn't be feasible so dr rick haney you awake i am and, and, and you know those were both epic fails i wasn't dead or in a rock and roll band so i'm not sure what i'm not sure what that even means but yeah. well yeah i'm here i've seen yes, you jam is- i've seen you jam on the drum set that you have so i, I think rock and roll band is feasible without a doubt yeah, I'm gonna start. We're gonna start a new band, and we'll, we'll call it the Guineas. There you go. They're pretty. Yeah. They're pretty noisy back there. I like. I do like the sound of Guineas, so that's not gonna bother us. At least we can hear you now. I appreciate you hanging tight with me there for a while. Um, 
So, so I'm going to, I'm going to go right to the meat and potatoes of all this. I get an enormous amount. People now know I'm a, I'm a, a groupie of, of Dr. Rick Haney and I'm, I'm a disciple. You're my mentor. I've learned a boatload from you. I'm quite frankly, and this is all my opinion, by the way, not necessarily yours. I'm pissed off that people deem it necessary to, um, create these, these fancy documentaries without, Dr. Rick Haney, the only guy who can measure soil health. So that I'm, I'm kind of puzzled by that, and I certainly don't want you to comment on that. But um, I want to talk about something today that next to the, the biggest question I get about, about reload is what's in it, right? And, and people think I'm trying to hide it, and yeah, I, 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 I'm not. But the, the nec- the, 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 most of the confusion that I hear in this soil health and regen ag that no one's answering. And I've heard this just yesterday, a guy in Alberta called me up and he's looking for a consultant and he wants some help. And he said to me, you know, I've, I read so-and-so's book and I watched so-and-so's videos on, 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 um, uh, I won't even mention the, the platform anymore. Uh, how come they never, you know, they talk about, you know, weaning off of or cutting synthetics, but they never talk about pH. What's going on with pH? So, you and I have had discussions about pH. I'm going to ask you a true/false question. Uh, we'll start it off easy. I won't. I'll, I'll throw some softball pitches to you. You just, just answer answer a simple true or false to this question, and you can't give me some BS gray area PhD answer either. Give me the truth. pH is highly controlled by the biology in the soil. True or false? True. All right, you can go maybe. You no, can, you can go, go maybe gonna, if you no, want. I'll go through. I, let, <laughs> let me put it like this. This, you see, see how I know. You are, I know. You got. You're like it's like oh, I'm gonna give pitch your fat one. You know, softball, you know, slow pitch. Like no, it's like so. True or false is this is is highly. You said highly controlled. I did. So, you want me to yeah, reread so, it because you're not you're not looking at it. I understand. And no, and, no, and, that's fine. But, you know what? If but, you want, there's a lot of podcasts out there. I mean, gee, everybody has a podcast now, right? It's like it's like contractors. You put a magnet on your door, all of a sudden you can, you know, redo somebody's kitchen. But you know, th- it's all softball pitches, and it's all, you know, the same BS, and they recycle the same people. And what I like about you is you are the only guy whose mind thinks like the system works. Everyone else likes to act like they think like. The, and th- again, this is my opinion, so no one should feel offended by this. They they should email me. The hate mail can come to me. I already filter it out, but that's that's all I want. I want someone to answer that. pH is highly controlled by the biology. So if you want, I'll give it. I'll make it open ended. Can, can you pH, elaborate pH on is, that? Is pH is manipulated by the by the by the biology. It is a function of geology and chemistry. However, what one of the problems that we have with with pH is, is uh, farmers. Boy, that's a usually the first thing they look at on a standard soil test is pH. And is food plotters. Sense. And food plotters. That's well, their sure. biggest on, concern. Every, any, about any soil test, the pH is the first thing to look for. Like it's the holy grail. And and it's not the holy grail. It has it has its uses and it has its functions and it's a good test to look at. But what does that mean? Is is pH static? In other words, if you just keep taking pH over and over on the same plot of land, even though you've changed the management dramatically and you put manure on or you've done all these different things, is it still going to be the same pH? And the answer is no, it's not. Well, most guys but would say if, if, you, if you put lime on it, it'll change. That's what but, changes but, pH is lime, two tons yeah. to the acre. Right, down, down how deep. <laughs> so if we put a ton per acre of lime on the soil and, and, and plow it in three inches deep, you change the pH three inches deep. Is that, is that as far as a root, a root goes? No. no. So the root still has to, being a biologically active system, the plant root, it still has to sense that environment, whatever that pH is, and adapt to it or attempt to change it. So the extract that I developed is based on organic acids that plant roots use to manipulate the pH environment. Okay. So okay, hold there on. you have Hold on. Hold on. So, the extractant, okay. back up for some of the people like me who were C students. What, what do you mean by extractant? What's an extractant? Well, it, uh, extra, so when you send a soil to a lab, they mix up a certain set of chemicals and 
and mix it with the soil and then shake it and centrifuge it and filter it. Just like nature does, right? Just like, yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) That was a joke, by the way. No, it's a good joke because the centrifuge, I guess, is earth spinning around on its axis and then rotating around the sun. So that's Mm -hmm. the centrifuge. Makes sense. Perfect sense. But anyway, what we talked, oh yeah. So the thing that, the reason I said true is because the plant root, regardless of the pH it finds itself in, has the ability to adapt to whatever it finds itself in. We have pH 8.3 soils at the research farm. That, that's just a ridiculously high pH, and yet things still grow, mm-hmm. which they shouldn't, but they do. And the research so, farm is in Texas, by the way, for those who is. don't know. It, it's high clay and high pH. It's the strangest soil in the world, but, but, but plants grow and they adapt. And that, I mean, and, and all these folks about, you know, that are like on the fence about cover crops, it's like, look, you know, Trust the plant. The plant knows what it's doing. We're the ones that don't know what we're doing. But if you put a plant in the ground, it's going through a massive amount of complex calculations and sensing and and responses that we we can't even begin to understand. But we know it works because plants grow, right? Especially when it rains and we have sunshine and there's dirt. That mm. this is really about all you need to know. Now, now the tricky part is what plants. Certain plants are adapted to certain environments and others are not as well adapted. And we've been spent, we spent years at the research forum trying to figure out what cover crop mixes to put out. And we, and we're still experimenting, mm-hmm. but, but now we're going to, we're, we're doing soil analysis a little bit differently and that's helping us give us some insight into what these cover crops are actually doing in a given piece of land. Okay. So is that dog killing the Guinea? No, he that the, he was agreeing with what I just said. Oh, okay. He's highly trained. So, so before we get off this pH thing, because I'm told that people are really upset that there's not enough time in the soil health arena spent on pH. If I have a soil, maybe it's a new plot, maybe it's an old plot, it doesn't matter, and it's five two five three, or it's not, you know, it's not in that ideal six five six 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 eight seven range, right? That tri- tri- what what I should say that human what the humans think ideal is if it's your food plot how concerned are you with with and i've seen some of these the the conventional or standard soil tests i mean they they will recommend you know half of a quarry full of lime for some of these five two five three phs but how 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 much are you concerning yourself with getting lime to it and and if you are is that just an initial thing until you get plant diversity in the ground or, um, or, you know, do you see what's the end game on it? In well, your the opinion? first thing I would the first thing I would do is plant the whatever cover crop mix you know you came up with, and see how it does. If you see the effect the effects of low pH on it, then maybe you start considering putting a little lime on and try to address the problem, and then you know replant, see what happens there. So this is not there. There just aren't any hard and fast answers to anything. It's like well, it's this or that. Well, we're looking, we're, we're looking at a dynamic system. So let it tell you what needs to happen instead of us just deciding based on some chemical test that we pull out of the lab that it's this or that. I mean, that's just saying basically that nature doesn't know what it's doing and, we're, and we've got to step in there and, and make sure it understands how it should be working. And that's just not how nature works. So my, my approach would be to get, get plants in the ground and see how they respond first before I worried about liming. I, I've seen soils in the, in the five pH five region that do just fine. Mm-hmm. And then you see others that don't do very well at all. So that's a, that's a plot by plot comparison yeah. that and, you're going to have to look at. And thank you. Yeah, thank you for having the guts to answer it because that's what I am seeing, not only on the 40 acres of food plots that I work with here in Pennsylvania, but with other clients. And that is, and they think I'm losing it when I tell them just put just put spring reload in the ground when the soil temperature hits 45 and rising, and forget about your lime. I you know I I haven't seen lime spreading or product show up on my expenses in at least six or seven years, and that that's as long as I've been farming in nature's image, right? So I I, I just took I just took plants and started playing with them, researching them, 
and again, th- there could be up to 60 or 70 different things put in each, each one of my research plots. I'm not saying that all of them are growing, but you get the point is I'm throwing the, the kitchen sink. Uh, in fact, I almost took a picture. I almost took, I, I saw a kitchen sink sitting on the, uh, in the garbage the other day in town. And I was going to take it and throw it out in my field and take a picture of it and send it over to you and say, hey, I threw the kitchen sink at it finally. But I didn't have time to do all that, so I just I didn't do it. But I'm basically, that's what I'm doing is I'm throwing diversity at it. I haven't had and, – and I just I just said to you earlier, I said, yeah, you've seen the stuff I'm growing. You've seen the, the stuff that these other people are growing. I mean, it's – my covers are over my tractor tires, and I'm running the roller crimper on it and obviously laying down a massive amount of, of plant residue. So – I think that, that uh, put put plants. Ironically, this is almost the answer to everything um, when it comes to um, getting you know getting carbon back in the ground, and that is just put plants in the ground. Yeah, it seems almost too simple. To... It does, and that's it, that, that's yeah. People are looking but for a justification think, to do something more complicated. I think sometimes. I think the thing that is so critical to understand is that we have very limited knowledge on how plants actually function in soil and what they actually do, how they manipulate the system to their benefit so that they can grow because they're interested in reproducing themselves. And, you know, it's, it's life or death to plants. It's not, you know, Oh, well, not a big deal. It's very important that they survive and they have come up with mechanisms. We don't even begin to understand yet, but we're, you know, we're starting to look in that direction. Mm -hmm. And so trusting the plant is a huge, uh, step forward in my in my opinion right okay i don't know should i and i want the listeners to know that we i didn't script this i i I don't have the only thing on my desk right now is a notepad and a couple of notes on it of things i wanted to ask you so this is completely shooting from the hip about things you and i talk about all the time um you know i don't know where to go with it because i could talk all day with you about some of this stuff you know what we talk about the standard soil test which uh, it's it even pains me anymore to invest my time in boxing up, you know, bagging and boxing up samples and sending it to these guys. And I'm sure they're good people, but I just, I don't do anything with it, but file it away. And, oh, wow, look, the pH is six, eight and holy smokes, the, you know, soil organic matter is, is getting better. The, the, so, so while we're on it, the two things that we really look at on these standard tests are pH and soil organic matter, right? So, is is and I, I know you you know again I mentioned those other podcasts that you're on because we got into the house we got into the food we got into all that stuff in those podcasts but I know you're a big fan of 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 carbon so isn't so how important is this SOM um, soil organic matter to to what we're doing do we even need to worry about it and track it and be so proud that we're finally seeing it increase. Um, is it really the soil? Is it the carbon stock? Is 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 that something that we should be focusing on? Well, I I think it's very a very important measurement. However, it doesn't tell you anything, not anything, about how your soil's functioning, and that is critical. We have for decades ignored all this. It's like, well, yeah, you just you know add this much fertilizer to it, yeehaw, off we go. Well. What did we end up with? We ended up with a, a bunch of organic matter levels dropping, erosion, you know, dead zone in the Gulf. I mean, we 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 created an enormous amount of problems with that kind of you know limited thinking. And so, to challenge ourselves to better understand how soil actually functions for real out in the field, not not in a lab or not in our mind, but out in the field, how does it actually function? And what can we do to help it? Is absolutely critical. And so. Organic matter is a fine measurement. It's like, yeah, here's the carbon stored in that soil, but how is it functioning? Mm-hmm. How much of it? What's the microbial activity? How is it responding to the water extract of organic carbon, the food source that it sees? How is it responding to that? What's the seed-in ratio of that food source? Is this a healthy system? I mean, these are questions that we've just completely ignored since the beginning of soil testing, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And they give us tremendous insight into our management system, the decisions that we're making, you know, th- we have to have more information about a complex system to make intelligent uh, choices. Right. So, so what I'm hearing you say is that we don't understand at all how the system works. And beyond that, we don't know how to, how to test it. So in other words, damn, that's a, that's a noisy Guinea. Well, I'm telling you, do they eat good? They eat way too good. It, you know, 
my wife really wanted them and i was like okay now they're noisy and she's like oh it'll sound like a farm it's like yeah <laughs> Uh-huh. We're on three acres in you know, Texas. But anyway. Yeah. So 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 I won't go to my I won't I won't tease doctors. I'll stay off of that. I I tell you what, I'll just go to this. Okay, so great input on soul pH. Really good piece on soul organic matter. It's it's fun, you know, it's it's fun to know and track, but but can I mean we could probably steer the cart without it, right? We don't really need to know exactly whether we're you know Point eight or one point six, it doesn't matter. What what? So so we're we're talking about soul health, and this is what cracks me up about a lot of this stuff. And I've had clients say this, or, or just you know, just listeners email this. It's like, hey, you know, everybody's beating up the standard soil test. We never knew how to read it anyway, so we don't have a problem dumping it. But what's so different about this Haney test, and what are you looking at? And you and I have had this. And, this conversation about CO2 or respiration, right? We're both um, uh, nerds of dirt biology. And so, so I I guess it gets me back to this question is what, what is, or what parameters can we study in the soil that actually look at the, the way it functions or the way it nature wants it to function what should we look at well let's let's say we got three rooms uh let's say we're some corporation we have three rooms full of workers right we could actually take a co2 sensor and put it in those three rooms and connect those remotely and look at the amount of co2 coming out of each one of those rooms the rooms that are really in there working hard they're taking in lots of oxygen and giving off a lot of co2 they're actually working whereas let's say you know room a is got half the CO2 coming out. Well, guess what? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that that, you know, there's not much going on in there. And it's the same way in the soil. When we do a CO2 measurement, it's like, it tells us several things. It's like, how healthy is this system? How much do they like the food that you're giving it, the carbon that you're giving it? And why is that important? Because without respiration, the system doesn't function. I mean, we don't do very well without respiration. We tend to die. So, You've got to have good food source, and you and you go. You want to have good activity because it's an indicator of the food that you're giving it. So if you're if you're giving them this set of cover crops, and let's say the respiration is 100 part per million, let's say you switch to another cover crop mix the next year, and you get about the same rain and and temperature and stuff, and all of a sudden your respiration increases. Well, what does that tell you? That means they like the food that you're giving them better now than they did before. And yeah. that is critical to getting the system up and running and functioning faster. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is the part, and obviously you know that, that in here in the near future, um, that there will be, people will find out that, that I've been working on a big project with, with real time CO2 and how that equates to soul health. And obviously collaborating with you on all this and, um, with the whole CO2 factor. But I think what, what bothers me most is that people aren't talking about this. Um, do you remember 1920? You remember that year? Yeah. I was just graduating high school. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, and you're older than me. So figure that out. But yeah. you know, in, in 1920, and, and I know you know all this. Um, you're a PhD, right? You're a soul scientist, but whatever. I'm I'm just a dear geek who thought it would be really cool to to go back in and study um, the the research and uh, even some of the just just the, the the interesting characters back in the day who learned how to observe nature before they had to worry about randomly replicating and peer reviewing and all that nonsense, which, uh, well, I'll leave that there. But so, so in 1920, when you and I were in high school, um, there was a Swedish character and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a Swede, so I'll probably butcher his name, but it was, it was something like Henry, Hen, which Henrik technically Henrik Lundegord. And, and so, so Henrik was, was concerned. He said, you know, I, I don't, I'm a big proponent of this, this idea that you can use biology in the dirt to, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, to drive crop productivity, right? And he said, yeah, I, I'm not a big fan. I don't really like what I'm hearing about these people who are 
um, are selling this idea of mineral plant nutrition. And quite frankly, I'm really worried about this rush of, of people who want to use inorganic chemicals um, to drive crop productivity. 1920. What year is it? 2021. Why are we not talking about CO2 and what these guys wanted to, and he called it the CO2 factor. He wanted to look more into CO2. He probably didn't have uh, the CO2 um, instruments that you were just alluding to. I'm trying to be vague, but who makes, who makes the, the sensors, the CO2 sensors from what country, China? No. Where are they made? Not the ones we're using. That's sweet, as it turns out. Sweet. Wow. Imagine that. They come from yeah, Sweden. Weird. Hmm. So I guess my point there is, as I'm reading this stuff that, that we forgot, that, and I'm not attacking, obviously you're a PhD and you're way smarter than me, but what happened to just common sense and, 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 and following what these guys had um, laid out for us some somewhere along the lines and you you talked about this i think in the very first podcast that i don't remember what episode that was but early on um and and the the synthetic obviously you know nitrogen and fertilizer industries so i guess let, let's let's talk a little bit well, more let me, about let me say this let me let me say this from a farming perspective let's say you're a farmer in the 19 whatever 40s 20s 30s 40s right and you're growing your 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 crop, let's say you're growing corn and you're making 40 bushel corn, all right? And you're doing really well. You're very happy with that. 40 bushel? And then they, 40. Yep. And then here, here we come along with this new shiny tool called synthetic fertilizer. And we went to put that out there and it jumped to 60 or 70. Ooh. That made you feel good. It made you feel like you were accomplishing something. And here oh, yeah. we go. Yeah. My right? banker will give you me more money too. You can see the hook. Yeah. You can see the hook. But, 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 but what we lost in that was the ability to just – what you said earlier was just right. Those guys had the, uh, had the time and the know-how to observe nature. My, di- my Ph.D. dissertation is littered with references and papers from 1895 to 1930 hmm. because they were on the right track. They were seeing – they were looking at nature from nature's perspective. And then when we got all the chemistry that showed up, due to all the new innovation for things, you know, it changed the system. Mm-hmm. And we got, we didn't have to be so observational anymore. We didn't have to, you know, pay attention. We said, oh, you just throw this out here and, and yeehaw, here it goes. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but it also got us to where we are now. And we didn't ever stop along the way and go, are we doing the right thing? Every now and again, it, it, it helps to do that, to stop and say, what are we doing? Okay, so I'm gonna change gears. That that was good stuff. So now let's talk about the fact that we've we've finally been enlightened here in the last. I don't know. I'm talking. I say we. I mean me and <clears throat> my clients and some of the followers of the Soul Health Movement. We've uh, we've actually done some good things, right? We've we're, we're starting to turn turn it around, and be, because of of the sensor that that you and I have been studying and. And the, the methods um, and the research that we've done, we're, we're able to <clears throat> quantitize, quantitize and say or quantify and say, wow, look at, look at these exponential increases. And, and again, I've got some where we started at 900 to 1,000 uh, parts per million. And this is, a, this is a different scale, on a different scale than yours, just so nobody's comparing this to their Haney test results. Um, and we've now gotten them up to over 6,000 parts per million. I'm back in Pennsylvania, by the way, and I think I'm allergic to the state and its politics. I need to get out, but um, am I, it's dry up here and the weather kills me up here. And I, of course I talk for a living, so I apologize for the voice, but so When how, how does CO two and and the study of respiration should should that play a role in picking whether it's cover crops for a, a farmer or species for guys like me for you know deer guys and wildlife food plots should should that play a role in any way? Uh, absolutely, I, because we you know we're looking at a dynamic system. 
you know, plants growing in dirt is a, is an incredibly dynamic, complex system. Mm -hmm. And we have at our disposal a simple, straightforward way to measure how dynamic it is, what it's trying to tell us, you know, I don't know how it gets any better than that. And it's such yeah. a simple process. Yeah. You know, microbes take in O2 and give off CO2. And we can measure that quickly. Isn't that I mean, cool? in real time. <laughs> I mean, that is it's just amazing. So you're basically going to say, well, you're going to go out to your field and say, how are you doing? And it's going to tell you. Mm -hmm. You know, well, today it's cold and, you know, we're not cranking out like we need to be or just dry or but now, you know, things are going good. Here's the high. Here's what we can do. Here's our potential. I mean, this is this is just going to be fantastic information to tell us something, you know, in the field instead of having to take a sample and send it to lab. Real time. And <clears throat> I remember um, I was reading some research from a long time ago, and, and they were talking about soil testing, the standard soil test being a, a – is it a destructive – is that what they called it? A destructive sampling method? Yeah, because you're basically you, when you take soil and get it in the lab and you mix it with all this chemistry and you do all these things and then you end up, you know, throwing it out. So you don't, you know, they call it destructive because you're you're using up the, the soil it, sample and then you discard. It's, it. it's disposable, right? It's one and done. Yeah. Whereas right. what what you and I have been working on is repeatable. It's extremely yeah. sensitive to yep. to management. It's extremely sensitive to the environment. Um. And it's 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 simple, and it's there for for you to draw information upon or on whenever you whenever it's convenient for you. So, go ahead. Well, and what I what I find so intriguing about it is how how dynamic it is, and how you, you think it's going to be this or that, and it shows you something else that you never even thought about. Yeah. It's like, wait, how can that be? Yeah. That that's the really exciting part. Of so, so obviously we'll get more into this. I, I really wasn't planning on talking about this. You, I know you and I are pretty passionate about this and we'll, we could do podcasts about, about it more in the future, uh, what we've worked on and what we're working on. But I think the biggest, before I jump into the next topic, the biggest takeaway for me that I've learned in the last year in, in working in the field, digging holes and playing with sensors and all of the statistics that, and, and calculations that you're far better at than me. But the one thing I realized is you can sit there and ask yourself questions, you know, like um, I'm, I'll say it, hopefully you don't yell at me later on that how many academics are there that you know of uh, who, who say, you know what, these microbes, they're um, let's talk in deer world. They're, they're nocturnal. Right, they're they're perhaps a little crepuscular and nocturnal. I, I I've never heard the 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 front minds in the soil health movement and the regen ag movement talking about, um, you know the the daily or the 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 circadian rhythms of of microbes. So my point here is, it's not just the questions that we've been asking ourselves; it's the stuff that we're learning accidentally while playing around with these things that that that's what has blown my mind and 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 you can see that you know the just the tip of the iceberg and you realize holy cow there's so much going on beneath the soil surface i just had this conversation with clients who yesterday who are used to accustomed to seeing beautiful monoculture plots above ground whether it's turnips clover soybeans corn they were really struggling with the fact that they don't have six foot tall soybeans anymore, but they, they do have, you know, uh, extremely diverse plots that they can't keep the deer out of. It, it's, you know, they're beating them with a stick to keep them out and they're all tagged out or passing bucks that they don't want to shoot. So uh, to me, that that's the most, the craziest part is as, as much as we think we know a lot about this system. We, we we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. No, and, and and what shocked me, and one of the things that we were talking about earlier, was you know what you said about that they're nocturnal. That you know, it just blew my mind that you know they don't have to have sunlight to photosynthesize. They don't photosynthesize. So losing they, you, they, losing you a little bit, Rick. You need to speak louder and into the into the phone. They react to. Uh, there you go. Okay. Is it windy so, in Texas today? Yes. Okay. It is. Anyway, long story short, they they are really active at night, and I never saw that one coming. 
I thought they'd be super active during the day. Well, that's photosynthesis. that's because you weren't paying attention in your PhD school. Because other other researchers know that they they know that they're they're active. They're they're. I'm using the term nocturnal because it's fun, but maybe I'm not using the right term. No, that's the right term. It's fun. It is fun. We're going to learn a lot with this system. I can tell you that. Yeah. So, so did other people realize that before we figured that out? I don't know. I have, I've never heard that before. I guess yeah. maybe I'm just naive or don't know, but it, it just really got me. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, right. wow, look at that. So let's, let's go into, I was, I was kind of leading into a segue there that I, that I lost track of, but I want to switch gears and get into, and I'll start, I'll just start it off to, to segue it. Um, I'll start off by, by giving a, a, a rather funny story about, so, so for, I guess, 10, 12 years, I consulted for um, some of the, some of the seed companies and uh, especially uh, Tecamati, who was obviously supplied by Baron Brug and those guys. And they would say to me, okay, so you, you know, you're in the Northeast um, or, or you live there. Can you help us make a blend or can you plant this particular blend? I remember, you know, David Morris said to me one time, we're going to, you know, send you some monster mix. Can you plant it? And tell me what you think. And we planted it. And I said, this is complete crap. It's junk. Great idea. I love the mutual fund approach to the diversity, which at that time was a relative term. It wasn't true diversity. Um, but I would, you know, I think we need to change some of these species a little bit. And we did that. And then as I got to know more of these people, I, I started to question, okay, who, who's your agronomist? So who, who's deciding what goes into these blends? Because quite frankly, I'm planting them on my farm. My clients are planting them all over the country and I don't think it's good enough. I, I think we can do better. I, I didn't know at the time, but th- that's how you get better by saying what, you know, open-ended, how can we do better? What else can we do? So I can remember, um, you know, Tecamati dealt with uh, uh, Baron Brug, uh, as did Evolved, two, two companies selling the same seed, different marketing, different person on the bag, whatever, uh, I'm game. Um, and, and I said, so I called him up. I said, who's your agronomist? I'd like to talk to him. So I'm talking to this guy and, you know, we're clicking and, and we have, you know, similar opinions about things. We're talking about hunting. And I said, so so uh, we'll just call him Joe. Joe, what's what's your background? Where'd you go to school? And uh, long story short, I find out he's an accountant. So at this point, I'm confused. Wait, let me get this straight. You're an accountant, and you're deciding what species and varieties go into a, a blend. And it was really about manipulating the the price of the seed, the cost to get to that fancy price point that pleased Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's and Gander Mountain Academy and Walmart and whoever else. And I thought to myself, well, that's not, I don't think that's how nature really wants it to be is based on profitability. That doesn't make any sense to me. So that was kind of the start of me going down a completely different rabbit hole. Um, but Rick, you know that I've, I've spoken to you at length for years now when, when I knew that we, we needed to get into diversity, complex rotations, and species complementariness, along with this idea that somewhat escapes people of quorum sensing. So how can we use, as you know, I'm a huge fan of the Haney test and the results. How can we use those results to, well, let me rephrase that. I started making blends based on, obviously, the soil health uh, parameters, but also based on the plant's ability to extract or mineralize or sequester or whatever fancy, sexy term you want to use, those nutrients that we want to push into the animals, into the, the, the wildlife scenery. And some of this goes back to my podcast with Fred Provenza, which was is still one of my favorite podcasts of all time because it sort of exposes the complexity, yet... Um, the the fact that all wildlife, especially ungulates, cervids, white tails, have this nutritional wisdom, flavor feedback, self med- med- medicinal um, 
characteristics. So I know I'm going on a lot about this, but I kind of want to talk about, because uh, I get a lot of emails from people who say, well, you're just making this sexy, not a lot, but a few. I don't understand, you know, what what is in it? You know, that all of a sudden they're, you know, it's like they want the secret sauce. There's no secret sauce. There, there, there are tricks to it, as you know, the research that we've done and we've looked at. So can you, can you, if you don't want to, or, or will you touch a little bit on, because coming from me, it, it might sound like sales and marketing and whatever, but can you touch a little bit on how it's feasible to, to make blends? And this is, I hope my competition is listening. Um, I, I know at least one of them is, and I, I hope that more people start blending seeds like this. I mean, the White Tail Institute still calls their, their newsletter or publication breaking ground. Like, I mean, that's antiquated. We need to change that, right? Um, you watch Mossy Oaks Hunting Show and, and they're, they're you know, disking and, and still promoting the standard soil test as the cheapest $10 uh, you know, insurance or investment. It's such a waste of $10. I'd rather, you know, <laughs> go buy bubble gum with it or something. So, can you touch a little bit on how we can we can choose plants or seeds to make a blend that not only work together from a complementary standpoint, but that also target a specific goal in making bucks bigger, making those in increasing lactation, recruitment rates, blah 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 blah. Was that too much? No. And one of the things I've gotten into in the last year is it, and it's, this is also such a simple concept. So. We started pulling different cover crop plants out of the ground that are growing. You know, they're a foot and a half tall, whatever, yeah. Yeah. growing along fine. We started pulling. Wait, those wait, out wait, of the wait, ground. wait. Pause. Here comes a secret. Here comes a major, a major secret that no one has heard anywhere else. Go ahead. Are you that, telling this? That was from me. Oh, okay. That's you, you, the floor is yours. So, so. Plants. When we take a bulk soil sample, we're getting a bulk soil sample result. Bulk soil and sample it, means means you just take you know soil. Let's say maybe nothing's growing out there; it's been plowed up or or everything's dead or whatever. And you just you take several samples, put them together, send it to lab. So the soil sample that we're all taking, well, yeah, m- that most are taking, right? Yes. So that's a bulk soil sample, and it's going to give you a snapshot of here's what's happening right now. This is what's going on. Then we started saying, well. We've got all these different cover crop blends and all these mixes. How do we know which one's the right one? Because we were getting really tired of trying all these different mixes. And, you know, it takes years to try to narrow it down to just, you know, a few. It's, it's years of research. It's years. Of, and then I, it, it hit me. It's like, well, how, why, why don't we just pull the plant up and what dirt comes off the roots? So you pull a plant up and it's got dirt attached to the roots, right? Mm-hmm. Let's shake that dirt off those roots in a plastic bag and get a, and pull enough plants to where we can get a good sample and let's analyze that. And we did that with a whole bunch of different species and it was absolutely eye opening. And it's like, because that's where the ball game is. The ball game is around the root. So if you want to know what this cover crop or that cover crop species, what the impact that's going to have on your soil and your microbial community and your, and your, your white tailed deer and your white. So that's the fun part because ah. I was talking to this guy, Jason, you know, C student, not too bright. Well, D, D, D in most cases. Giving him the benefit of the doubt because he's young. I did so, well. I did well in uh, gym class. Very well, well. I, 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 I'm not sure that's right. You're probably <laughs> exaggerating that. But. Yeah, I'm lying. But anyway, we were looking uh, at some of the data, and it was like, well, let's say we want to get uh, calcium into the diet of these these deer well we're looking at these all these different species of cover crops and would you pick the one that's got the highest calcium or the lowest calcium mm, i got and the I answer thought, wrong well, the first time if you remember yeah, I, yeah well i thought it'd be well it's the highest calcium it's like <clears throat> no it's, it's the lowest that means the plant took the calcium up mm-hmm. so with that understanding and i think the future of how we do mixes is needs to go down this 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 road yeah we need more so the thing that's beautiful about this if, is if you wanted to put a whole bunch of different species out and pull them out of your deer food plot you could get that analyzed to see what the real impact is you don't have to wait five years to figure out 
cover crop mix. And so now we're looking at specific impact of a cover crop root on your soil, under your management, on your on your food plot or farm. Or a plant root that, in general. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. is absolutely eye opening. And it and it changed the way we put, you know, th- this is for all of you who ask me, well, how did you decide which plants? You know, I want to do my own. And, you know, I- I'm not on fake book, fake book much anymore. Um, but, I, you know, I have that regenerative wildlife ag group that I started, which you know, I don't know why I started it. But, I'll, I'll, you know, it, it's fun, I guess. But you see guys trying to make their own blends and, and, and it's fun. And it's cute to do. But we, we, we are oversimplifying. It, it's so complex. There's so much going on. And to me, this was where it's at. So we, you know, we start to see individual species that are better at, like you said, pushing. Yeah, you know, you you want big bucks in in three years, or do you want them in six years? Right? Remember that conversation that we had. That, yeah. that to me, that's that's something I'm very proud of. That conversation you and I had. It was like a it was an aha moment. It was a duh. This this makes total sense. Where this also was fun and sexy and exciting is that now. We can pull plants from these competitors who think that their stuff's the greatest, or these other consultants who have web shows who think that the the their their sponsor who's dropping them a hundred thousand dollars a year in free seed is the greatest. We can compare. We can say, well, let's find out. Let's see what the plant thinks about it, and let's see what nutrients specifically the plant's sequestering and pushing into the animals. It could be it could be turkeys, deer, whatever. To me. That's the fun part, and uh, so I, I just wanted to maybe maybe we shouldn't have exposed that, um, you know. But but it, it's like you said, it was it was your brainchild, and we just kind of came together and said, you know what, this is good stuff. Uh, and, well, and, and there I, I were some species that really surprised us, weren't there? Really surprised us, and and I think the 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 point of this whole thing is that you know you can spend a lot of years trying to figure all this out, or you can get into some of this. And cut that time down dramatically. Yeah. And so, because what we're looking for here is not quantity. We're not looking at, a, you know, a 70 species mix. What we're looking at is that 10 or 15 that really make it happen. Mm-hmm. That, that is, so it's quality versus quantity. And I'll go for quality every time. Right. And if we can really start to nail that down, boy, now, now you've just kicked, you know, the whole regenerative ag thing into overdrive. Right. Now, now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. And, and just for, for those of you, you know, for those of you listening, I know, I know, um, I'm, I'm guarding against mentioning specific names, but there's finally somebody has decided that they want to follow along. And, and this, this is again, off the record, Rick, I'm, this is all on me. Um, you don't even know what I'm talking about. This is, this is a personal, uh, you know, competition is great. Um, un- unless you're the uh, big tech company, then you collude. But competition is what made America great. Capitalism works when you don't prop it up artificially with taxpayer dollars and inflation. But I'll get off my soapbox. There, there are some others that are that are migrating and following along. It took them a little bit longer, and I, I think that's what happens when you get your PhD, right? You kind of learn to be, you, you learn to question everything a little bit too much, and and you know analysis paralysis so i i I, it'll be interesting to see if others make blends based on this or if they'll continue to make blends so that they can fit it in the bargain bin price range and sell it to people who can't i should say and, and and they fail to sell it to people the right way and explain it to them as opposed to trying to make them happy with some fictitious price point. So that that was my little commercial since I'm funding the operation and that had nothing, no reflection of you. So I'll, I'll let you take over. Well, from that. <laughs> it's like, it's like this to me. Like we, we've been buying, we buy these little spray nozzles, right? And, you know, I was explaining to my 11 year old daughter the other day about how things work. You know, you can buy a super cheap little spray nozzle for your garden hose and you're going to buy five of them in a year, or maybe you could buy a $35 one that'll last you 10 years. Yeah. In the long run, the quality approach is better. You know, save your daggum money if you have to and get the good stuff. And here we go. And I, that's, I just think that's just the right approach because I've spent so many years doing research and, you know, more failures than successes. And when you, when you stumble across things that are simple straightforward mm-hmm. and really trying to do what nature designed to designed by nature so to speak 
you're ahead of the game. And, and, and in the long run, you're going to be better off. Yes, sir. And this, I'm, I'm beating on my desk here. I've got a stack of research that you conducted and that we've been going through marking off. It's highlighted with individual species. Um, ca- you know, the sexy names are fun. Reload, that was my my name. I'm sure someone will come out with Restore soon, and that's okay. Imitation is the best form of flattery, and that includes the the webinar guy who's following me to green cover seed here shortly to make his own blends. Um, yeah, put that in your country song that, you know, when, when, when I look at this research, it, it blows my mind and it's, it's, it's going to be so fun to be able to make a, a ROI blend. You and I laughed about that one day. If you want a, a big buck blend, right? The ROI, you get, you get your biggest return on investment. You get your biggest antlers, your highest lactation rates, whatever you're, you're gunning for. I'm going to start making limited quantities of a specific blend and only selling it to the people who identify that there's a true value in that. And that I think is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, because, it, you know, we're talking about discovery here. We're talking about nature showing us the secrets that we've been blindly overrunning with, you know, because we think we're so smart. When the reality is, you know, we're all students and we want to learn. And if we can just pause and let nature whisper in our ear, right. you know, we're down the road. Yeah, so so I appreciate my accountant a lot, um, but accountants should not be uh, blending or or – playing with excel spreadsheets and and making blends it blends should be made this way and for the record have any other blends been made this way through looking at haney health test results and and how those plants and roots function with specific with the extraction or sequestration of specific nutrients well no they have it i wonder if they did in the 20s well, since their sensors were not existent back then and stuff, I, I doubt it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Those guys back then, I, as I said, my PhD dissertation is just full of this kind of information. Absolutely, I was absolutely blown away by how nimble those guys' minds were. They they were just nimble. They were thinking about how does nature work from nature's perspective. You said it best earlier. It's like. If you look at how nature works from nature's perspective, that's a very different reality than looking at how we think nature works from our reality. Those are wildly different things. So, and nature's in, in the end, nature's going to win. Oh, for sure, one hundred and ten percent. It's hell. Yeah, nature's winning uh, from from so many aspects that we won't get into because I'll I'll get accused of being political or whatever. But you're right. Nature nature is the deciding factor. And, and speaking of nature and the future, CO2, I think you'll agree with me, CO2 is the future of soil health and nitrogen mineralization. And I think here shortly people are going to find out what we've worked on and the fact that we can not only uh, drop out of an airplane and land in your field and tell you grade in situ, which, which is the fancy way you guys say in the field, determine if your management agrees with nature or does your management go against nature? And I don't need, I don't I, you can blindfold me as long as I can feel the instruments, get it in the ground and read my little monitor. We can tell, correct? Yeah, I think, I think we're going to be able to do that. I think it's going to be fun, very exciting. And fun, I think fun. it's going to be very eye opening. And the end result for those who are in production ag which I know to you and I, we, 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 you know, not to sound like, you know, the, 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 the crazy green people, but we love this earth that we're on. And, and you mentioned the, the dead zone in the Gulf that pisses me off. Right. Yeah. And I think we have the ability to change that, to fix that and be more responsible about how much nitrogen we pump into the system. And obviously the, the CO2 and the biology, this, this population of biology or workers in the classroom or whatever your, your analogy was, is going to directly relate to impact and tell us how much nitrogen we can, just, just like your, your Haney Health Test does. The calculator on that thing is, is super cool. If you actually want to plant soybeans, wheat, corn, 
sunflowers, I don't know, you have some other species on there, and you want to be responsible and save money, you can punch in your desired goals and obviously outcomes, you know, your end input. So um, I think you probably agree that you can do this in the field now with with the application that we've been working on. Well, that's the goal, yeah. We, we want to be able to pull that off. And, and Because the thing that's so intriguing to me about CO2 is that even though it's it's variable, you can hear people say, oh, well, there's too much variability. Well, <laughs> Too much variability is the nature of the nature. I right. mean, that's how it works. So we have to figure out what it means and, and apply it in ways that make sense. I mean, because, yeah, it's variable. Well, guess what? That's It's got to be. So, But it's also consistent in its variability. It, 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 we'll go into that in another yeah. talk. Sometime. That's right. It's about the consistency of variability. That That's what's intriguing. Yeah, I agree. Yep. I uh I stood there and watched a no tiller. It's pretty cool. I'm I'm sitting between uh, I say between probably well one mile one way and about two miles the other way. Two completely different farmers. And I know you know a lot of the guys listening and girls listening are are wildlifers. And some of them, you know, we get into farming corn and beans. You know, obviously for for wildlife. But so so these are production guys. They they you know they're 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 larger farmers. They're they're big time guys. And one of them's you know, second or third generation conventional farming. He's a recreational tiller. He's always out there plowing and breaking shit up. And the other guy is a, a young, what I'm going to call a young guy because he's younger than me. Um, he's like a third generation family farmer. And he's he's gone. I mean, this is the guy who, you know, he buddies with another local guy and drives to no-till on the plains conferences. And he's just, he's hook, line, and sinker, you know, 10 or 11 years of no-till recently got into diverse covers um, and he understands it's not only about yield, it's about the bottom line and the net, obviously net profitability of his farm. So I've got these in field, in situ, um, what we'll call GNTs in each, in each management type. And it's so cool. I could take my 10 year old daughter, which I have done, as you know, those, the, the, the kids are pretty bright. They pick up on stuff real quick and they actually see things that we don't see sometimes. And and what you see, the differences are absolutely amazing. Just it it, it just blows you away when, when you, you're looking at that again that that the workforce, if you will, right? The, the the employees in the factory, the welders, the machinists, the engineers. The, it's 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 pretty impressive. So enough enough of tooting that. I just I, I think it's I think it's so big. It's it, it's it's even hard to wrap your mind around, but. Do you have anything else you want to talk about with soul health? We're we're approaching an hour, which doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know what it means to you, but um, people tell me they love listening to your podcast. I had a guy the other day. He he was he replayed all of them. You know, he, he went back to all three of them and and replayed them and um, sent me a whole list of questions. So I I do have some questions here about spring reload and stuff like that. If we can get into briefly or. Um, man, I miss that Texas. You. I miss that Texas wind. It's not too bad, but you know, at least it, you know, it's the sun shining and it's like 45, which is, you know, warm compared to what it has been. So I, right. let me just check and see if the guineas, no, I think the guineas don't have anything else to say. So. <laughs> it sounds like they're done. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. I'll just, you know, there, there's a lot of questions surrounding <clears throat> the spring reload. And the first thing I want to say is, you know, I talk about zero synthetics and obviously, you know, you don't need fertilizer. I don't want you using herbicides and, you know, um, Rick, actually you and I had this conversation when I was developing them and I sent it to you and I still couldn't wrap my mind around this idea of not, you know, not using fertilizer at the time. And, you know, so, so guys are like, okay, so, you know, I can't use, I can't use fertilizer with your blends or they use these, these exclusive terms like, you know, I have to, so I have to no till drill the spring reload. And that's not, that, that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. And that, that lack of education is my fault. That's, I should be doing more of these. Those seeds are no different than, than the shiny, the, the seeds you buy in the shiny, sexy bag um, with the beautiful woman on them at, at, at Walmart or Bass Pro or wherever you get your seeds. It's the same, you know, it's a plant, right, Rick? It takes water. 
It takes yep. it takes a little bit of dirt. It takes some biology, and it takes sunlight. So basically, water and sunlight. The, the, this funny thing we call photosynthesis, and they grow. So they're, they're not. It's not that the seeds are different. It's not that they're special. It, it's the as you just heard. It's the the why behind which species we selected on a football team. I always use the football analogy. You know, you don't have two quarterbacks. You have a backup quarterback, but he's not between the lines. You know, while the other quarterback's under center, he's a backup quarterback. And that's kind of how I look at the blends. You know, sometimes you have two tights. You have everyone double tights. Sometimes you have one tight end, right? Um, so that, that's kind of how we run the blends. And, you know, no, you do not have to no-till them. If, if you want to disc, if, if you don't have a drill, you obviously have to get seed to soil contact right rick i mean what what seed's going to grow without seed to soil contact uh not many i mean yeah you could throw rye in the back of your pickup truck and it, it probably will grow cereal rye right yeah it but, probably will but not like the stand that you're expecting not like the pictures on the drop time seed website and certainly not like the stuff you see on tv which most of the time i always got a kick out of tecamati who i worked for and i i I, I left working with him a while ago and recommended one of my good friends from Mississippi State, and he's now doing the television show, Mark Newell, good friend of mine. But I'll never forget the commercial they shot um, in an alfalfa field. It was an irrigated alfalfa field that, that was being propped up with more synthetics and, and, and moisture than you could ever imagine. And, you know, it was supposed to be one of their food plots, and I just kind of laughed and thought, what a misleading, what a misleading idea. So... Again, it, I guess getting back to the spring reload, you know, people always want to know what's in it. Well, it's not a secret. It's it, there's there's definitely an art. As soon as I as soon as I disclose exactly what's in it, I'm going to change it, right? I'm going to send a substitute tail back in or a substitute full back in to get my first down on on second and short or third and short or whatever, right? So, um, you know, but but I'll go over most of them since you guys kind of hung in there. Um, as the as the wind blows Rick around, you know, spring reload last year, 2020, was 17 different species. And in 2021, I'm already taking pre-orders for it. Um, and, and it's looking like it's going to be about the same as last year with a little bit of a, a slight modification. But spring peas, common vetch, um, spring lentils, crimson clover, bursine clover. One of my favorites, Rick, I don't know if you plant any Hubam white sweet clover down there, but, man, that is such a cool plant. Um, spring oats, spring trit, spring barley, um, hybrid brassicas, purple top turnips, collards, flax, safflower, sunflower, chicory, plantain. I, I, I really enjoyed putting plantain in there. I think, you know, you talk to the sheep people and, and plantain is, is super, super cool. I still laugh when I, when I posted it on, on fake book one time about what was in the blend and, and a couple of guys, they, they were having, I mean, they were, they were having a good time with this idea that I had bananas in, in the blend. They, they, they thought plantain was bananas. Um, I, I guess it sits by the dried bananas in their, their grocery store, but I, man, I just love plantain. In fact, when I put plantain and chicory in some of the, uh, uh, pollinator blends, you can't, you can't keep the deer out of it. So yeah, imagine that. Yeah. Um, other than that, you know, a lot of people ask, do I have to do, you know, do I have to plant all three of them? No, absolutely not. And actually what we're starting to see is it's, it's going to be a function of what you had in that plot the previous year, what you're planning on, you know, what your objectives are for the, the successive growing season. But, you know, we're also seeing in different regions of the country, whether I'm in Alabama or Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania or Maryland or wherever, Texas, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't always make sense to, to put certain personnel on the field, you know, at, at that time. So sometimes we'll put spring reload in and let it go and let it do its thing and, you know, pump carbon and obviously build biomass and residue all summer. And then we'll, we'll utilize that and, uh, uh, you know, hold, hold and release those nutrients, obviously for the follow-up crop, which for us is, uh, you know, is, is the fall hunting season plots. So I should probably stop talking because my voice is killing me by uh, cutting out. Rick, do you have anything else you want to talk about? What what irritates you? 
<laughs> being old and my body not functioning like it used to that that really irritates me a lot oh come on this is coming from the guy who so i, I chug i chug a lot of water because i'm getting old and these podcasts you know they, they don't last long any, any of my clients who know me if they talk to me for longer than 30 minutes i'm, I'm having to take a leak break so you know I, I offered you a leak a leak break before we started and you were good to go so your body can't be failing you that much that's true that's a good point yeah stop have- whining yeah, I will. I'll stop wanting. No, I don't. I don't really have anything else. I think we covered things pretty well. Maybe intrigued some people. Who knows? Yeah, maybe maybe turn some off. Yeah, I'm sure of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, yeah, that was definitely enough enough for today. There's we could go on and on, and I'm sure you and I will after this. But uh, I think you know, in the near future, obviously, send me emails and you know, call me, text me, whatever for questions about what, what Rick and I have worked on, um, from, from the CO2, the respiration aspect. And, you know, we, we laugh, we, we, we call it GNT bio machines, not a great name, but it's the name. That's, that's kind of what we've been calling it for a year as we've spent countless hours researching it and, and, and playing around with it. My, my, I can't wait until the academics, and this is from me, Rick, because you're obviously intelligent, but that's why I study a lot of these, this the research back into the twenties and thirties. And like you said, it, it kind of got uninteresting. Uh, is that the right word? Disinteresting? Sure. Yeah. It, it became, uh, bogged down with, with, uh, corruption and at a certain point there, as you alluded in your your uh, your research, um, but I enjoy reading that because these guys think, you know, I, I looked at one one instrument. They they made this soil array out in the field, trying to test pretty much what we're looking at, and a couple other useless items, and and they had like forty or fifty thousand dollars of of taxpayer dollars. No, it wasn't taxpayer dollars. You might say it was. It was funded through the land grant institution. Yeah, taxpayer dollars, and uh, and it was funny because I I remember sending it to you and saying, okay, so let me get this straight: the average farmer is going to spend fifty thousand dollars for an apparatus that looks like this to sit out in his fields and and study different management. And I don't think so. So I'm looking forward to that part of it, and um. Obviously, a lot of those guys are your your peers, so I'll uh, I'll be kind. Well, I think, and I think your your new T shirt is going to say something like "Breathe and trust the plant." <laughs> See, that gets them both. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I, I wear those. You know, your your plants fix dirt comment, which I took to heart years ago. I still get people. I wear it all over the place. My kids have them, and you know, there's a limited number of them. My clients have them. I get comments in the airport all the time. People love the shirt, and every now and then there's some people who are offended by the word dirt, and I just say, yeah, you know what? You're right. We'll consider that in our next run of, of 10 million shirts. Maybe we should call it soil. You're right. So I kind of have yeah. fun with that, but it, it's well, dirt. Most know, of it's dirt. It Most of it is. It, it, I think we get carried away with – I remember when I was in graduate school, we was at an international conference, and some guy came up, and he said, well – he was like – well, that's not very good dirt, and they and all everybody got all offended. It's like, oh my God, it's soil. It's like, is this a reflection on the actual soil or on you <laughs> and your profession? So that that always stuck with me. It's like, I don't really care what you call it. That's right. Let's just let's work with it. That's right. Let's let's work with it as we're as the system is intended to work, and that's why um, I'll I'll throw another punch because I'm enjoying it today. I'm kind of aggravated. I'll throw another punch at these these, and this is again this reflects my opinion, but. These documentaries that are going around, and and and, I, and I'll text you, and I'll say, hey, I saw new documentaries, you know, on uh, Netflix or whatever. Were you on that? And you say, nope. And and you're you're the most humble person I know. You don't you don't want to be on it. You could care less. But I, I think to myself now, you know, when you go to the doctor's office, they they start to check and everything, right? Whether it's it, it's actual, you know, useless or not, they listen to your heart. They listen to you breathe. You cough. They might juggle something. They look in your ears, your eyes, your mouth. Oh, you're swollen. You're this. They run through their dichotomous key and they go, well, you know what? Here's what I think is wrong with you. Take this antibiotic, right? So they, they, they have tests and I mean, they'll test you for everything from Lyme disease to COVID to whatever you think you might have. But how can we talk about soil health and regenerative ag without talking about 
the Haney Health Test, and this kind of research just blows my mind. I, I don't get it. Well, you know, I've always, again. I know, just, you're going to give a humble answer. No, it's just, it's just fam, you know, nature knows what it's doing. I've said this a million times. Nature knows what it's doing. We need to fall in line with it and try to understand it from its perspective instead of our own. And, right. and I just don't think we're going to get very far unless we, you know, really let it teach us. That that that's the crux of what I believe. Anyway, I agree. Patience and observation. Uh, that everybody wants wants the answer now, and they want it. You know, all the right answers, and they want it now. So that's that's a good that's a good optimistic place to leave it. Uh, Rick, super appreciate you spending time. We'll do it again here soon. Take care of the guineas. Uh, you can get up out of your chair now. Hang hang around. I do I do want to talk just a little bit more. Um, about a couple of things. So I'm gonna I'm gonna okay. go ahead and talk to the listeners here. Hang, hang on for a sec. All right, guys, everybody. I know that kind of ran on there at the end, but man, I it, it's hard it's hard to nail down a time when Rick and I can really just talk about this stuff. And uh, gosh, we we've spoken for hours on end about things, and I wish all of it could be recorded for uh, for podcasts, but obviously we can't. So I just want to thank everybody again. I know everybody enjoyed that Adam Darty podcast adam has expressed he wants to come back he feels like he left uh, some information on the table that he didn't expose and i i totally agree with him so we will get that scheduled here soon in the meantime um, i do want to say that the uh the pre-orders are running pretty quickly now on spring reload that's that's good i think we'll spread it out there's no need certainly no need to rush to it to order it but um it's it's been great because it's spreading out uh, those orders, I think we'll be able to uh, <laughs> hopefully not run out like we did last year and uh, and extend it a little bit more into the growing season uh, all the way across across the country. So th- those are pre-ordered um, running. And then obviously I'd like to ask everybody again, if you don't mind, uh, we you know, what keeps us going are the reviews and, uh, and obviously the ratings. So Thanks, everybody, for listening. And the way that you contact me, uh, other than getting information through the podcast, is my email, jason at droptinewildlife.com. And, of course, jason at droptineseed.com. A lot of a lot of folks are using that. That's, that's fine as well. So I uh, super appreciate everybody listening. And uh, I've got some really good podcasts coming up here that I can't can't wait to get recorded for you or or edited and sent out. So thanks again to everybody and uh, make it a great week.